Trinity family, I hope that you are having an absolutely wonderful Sunday and worship. I first want to say thank you to our pastoral team. They are preaching today, they are covering the service today. I'm just taking a Sunday off. February was a busy month. Oh my goodness. We did so much work. We had no idea it was gonna take so much time to put everything together. There's so many more moving parts when you're doing things, quote unquote, hybrid, which means we're doing some things live and we're doing some things that we have to edit. And so I wanna say thank you to our team. I know you will be blessed by the message coming from Reverend Kevin Murphy. He has a word in store for everyone today. We have an incredible team, and I'm so very grateful that they are allowing me just for this moment, just to be able to enjoy worship with my family. So enjoy worship today. I know that you will be blessed, and I'll see you next week. God bless.
Almighty God, and to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples when they asked, Master, teach us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
blood of Jesus, it will never lose its power. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to Trinity United Church of Christ. And we are worthy of your praise, O oh God. And we thank you for joining us today as you worship with us. God is doing a mighty thing at Trinity United Church of Christ. And you are preparing to witness how God will move in a magnificent and a special way. We know you will be blessed by the amazing worship experience that has been curated with you in mind. So as we worship today, we want you to share a few things that are happening in the life of Trinity and in the community. Now let us direct our attention to Trinity News and the offer. Hey, Trinity family, listen, you already know what time it is. It's time for Trinity News. There are so many amazing things happening here in the life of our church, and we want you to be informed, remain engaged, and stay connected to our work and ministry as we seek to lift up Christ, engage our community, and celebrate our culture. Let us go now to Trinity News. Join Pastor Moss next Sunday, March 13th at 2 p.m., for a live streamed book notes discussion with guest Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis, author of Fierce Love. Fierce Love offers a healing antidote to our divisive culture and a manifesto for all generations. You don't want to miss this soul healing book discussion. To register to attend, scan the QR code or log on to our website www.trinitychicago.org. To the village of Trinity, please open your e-newsletter. We have a survey for you in reference to CDOT, that is the Department of Transportation. We need you to fill out this survey so we can share this information with the Department of Transportation to let them know what this community wants and what this community needs. We need you to fill out the survey. Use the QR code to scan the information. It will open up on your phone or other device so you can fill out the survey in reference to the Department of Transportation's proposal around 95th Street. Thank you very much. This has been your Trinity News. There was a time when the idea of a black Wall Street was not unusual in our community. Banks, grocery stores, insurance companies, and even hotels were not uncommon in many African-American communities. Through your generosity, your church, Trinity United Church of Christ, has pledged and continues to support black-owned businesses, such as our federal credit union, the Black Farming Community of Black Oak Center in Pembroke, Illinois, Black professionals, and Black-owned banks and financial institutions. Today, your gifts of tithes and offerings will allow this work to go on for future generations. Let's continue to reinvest in our community and honor the legacy of our ancestors. For scripture says, give, invest, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shake it together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give, the amount you invest, will determine the amount you get back. There are multiple ways for you to support the ministry of Trinity United Church of Christ with your tithes and offerings. You may give through our Secure Give app. You may also text to give by dialing 855-781-8384. Give via our cash app, dollar sign, Trinity UCC, or use our website. With a few easy clicks, you will be well on your way to support this ministry. Also, our First Fruits Direct Draft Program allows you to make your church a priority. And if you prefer to mail your gift, simply send your tithe or donation to 400 West 95th Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60628. Thank you for supporting Trinity United Church of Christ, the greatest church this side of the Jordan. Those gathered in our virtual space, 
we ask that you stop wherever you are, that we might engage collectively in our holy communion. Let us pray over our elements. Gracious and most loving God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you did on an old rugged cross. And now, Lord, as we strive to be in a right relationship with you, Lord, bless these, your elements, the blood and the bread. We thank you, O oh God, we praise your name. It is in the matchless, mighty, magnificent name of Jesus that all who love him say, amen and amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took the bread, lifting it to heaven and gave thanks, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which will be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. He took this cup after supper, it's saying, this cup is the covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Here at Trinity, we confess our sins corporately through the reading of our confession of sins, which is appearing on your screen at this time. If you are able, please stand and recite our confession of sins as we read together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we come before you acknowledging our sins, our shortcomings, and our breaking of our covenant with you. Not only have we done things we ought not to have done, said things we ought not to have said, left undone so many things we ought to have done, and been silent when we should have witnessed for you. Not only are we guilty of that, O oh Lord, but we have also closed our eyes and pretended not to see the injustices, the racism, and the evil which pervade our everyday lives. We have shut our ears and pretended not to hear the cries for liberation which come from the lips, lives, and hearts of the oppressed, even our own black brothers and sisters. Forgive us, O oh Lord, renew our courage and faith, and keep us ever mindful of thy great sacrifice. Hear us, we beseech thee, as we come to you in love and worship giving your name the praise forevermore. Beloved, we have prayed together publicly. Now we ask that you visit your personal prayer closet and ask forgiveness for your sins. Let us pray. Gracious and most loving God, Lord, we often look to the left and to the right into the sins of others. But Lord, this prayer we ask that you come into those dark places in our lives, Lord. Purge us with hyssop that we might be clean. Wash us that we might be whiter than snow. Cast us not away from thy presence, nor take thy Holy Spirit from us. We need your prayers, Lord. We need your love. We need you to come in and fix us. It is in the matchless, mighty, magnificent name of Jesus that all who love him say, amen and amen. In Luke, 18, 12 through 14, Jesus tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee arrogantly brags that he fasts twice a week and pays tithes of all that he receives. But the tax collector stood at a distance, unwilling even to lift up his eyes to heaven. Instead, he beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus tells us this tax collector, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Communion is our opportunity, beloved, to get back in a right relationship with God by not looking at the sins of those on the left or the right, but looking in the mirror and humbly praying this prayer of that tax collector. God, have mercy on me. Again, Jesus took the bread, lifting it up to heaven and breaking it, giving it to his disciples saying, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Through the broken bread, beloved, we participate in the body of Christ as we take and we eat together.
And in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which will be shed for the remission of sins. Through this cup, we participate in the new life Christ has granted us as we drink together. And as we once more go to the Lord in prayer. God of our weary years, God of our silent tear, God who has a divine eraser in his hand, Lord, continue to move us to stay in a right relationship with you. We need you now more than ever, oh God. Help us to ask you to come into our lives daily so we may walk with you and talk with you and you may direct our paths. We thank you, O oh God, for this moment. We thank you, Lord, for what you did on an old rugged cross. It is in the matchless, mighty, magnificent name of Jesus, we pray. Let all who love him say amen and amen. Just wanna praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done, done for me. Blessings and glory and honor.
is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? At this time, we come to take our concerns, our pains, our joys to the throne of grace. Let us pray. Most holy God, we come before you, not in fear, but in faith. Not, Lord God, in dread, but in hope, knowing that you can do all things but fail. So, Lord God, as we hear of wars and rumors of wars, Lord God, as we hear of the uptick in violence in the Ukraine and the protests in Russia and the protests in New York, Lord God, and NATO, Lord God, even protesting the evil that is coming about, we stand hopeful, Lord God. We stand hopeful knowing that you are our God, the one who hears and answers our prayers, the one that we can t go to in the morning, the noon, and the, the midday, Lord God, knowing that we can take our concerns to you because you are our God. And Lord God, so we come to you in this moment asking you to touch every situation Meet us at our point of needs, Lord God. Touch every heart that we may do and say only the things that please you. Lord God, we come lifting up the name of Jesus, asking for you to touch the sick and shut in this day, Lord God. We come asking that you reach behind prison walls, Lord God, and inspire hope. We ask, Lord God, that you go to hospital beds, Lord God, and hospice beds, and heal, deliver, and set free. And Lord God, in our own homes, we ask that you teach us to love justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before you. So Lord God, touch us this day, renew us, strengthen us, and we give unto you all praise, honor, and glory in the blessed name of Jesus we pray amen I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark affliction starts to pray Declaring there is hope and there is free I speak Jesus Your name is God Your name is He Just wanna speak the name. 
shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, oh, oh, oh. stand before you this day hopeful hopeful not only in the joy of our salvation but hopeful knowing that eyes have not seen nor have ears heard the great thing that God will do for us at this time I want to thank Pastor Moss for this opportunity to stand before you today. I do not take it lightly. And there is a saying that whenever a pastor allows you to stand in his or her stead, that you are taking one of their turns because every turn is their turn. So Pastor Moss, I sincerely thank you for allowing me to take just one of your turns. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most holy God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you, Lord God, that everything we need is in this moment because you are with us. We ask, Lord God, that you speak to us and through us on the way to transforming us. And it's in the blessed name of Jesus the Christ, your Son, our very Lord and Savior, that we pray and we praise you with all thanksgiving. Let the church say, Amen. At this time, I wish to lift up a passage of scripture that many of us will find familiar. But today, in this moment, I invite you to look beneath the veneer of words and language and syntax to discover the treasure truth of scripture. If you have your Bibles with you, I ask that you please turn with me to the book of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. I will be reading today from the New International Version, and it reads this way, beginning with verse 1. 
As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. I wish to draw your attention during our time remaining to the topic, the power and purpose of now. The power and purpose of now. Now, as we continue to prepare our hearts and minds for today's message, I ask that you join me in prayer as I reflect on the words of Howard Thurman. Open unto me light for darkness. Open unto me courage for fear. Open unto me hope for despair. Open unto me peace for turmoil. Open unto me joy for sorrow. Open unto me strength for weakness. Open unto me wisdom for confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for sins. Open unto me tenderness for toughness. Open unto me love for hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Now that is from the Meditations of the Heart by Howard Thurman. Time. It is defined by physicists as the indefinite continued progress of existence and events in the past, present, and future regarded as a whole. Within it lies both joy and sadness. Time. It is a transporter of tears and triumphs, the purveyor of potential and promise. Its undulating waves carry events that are memorable and events that are unforgettable. I believe that were Pastor Moss standing here next to me, here in this time, in this moment, in this sacred pulpit, he would remind me that time also carries with it both pain and possibility. And though the river of time carries both pain and possibility, it produces no prejudice. It is not burdened by the cares of this world, nor that which it carries. It is not stretched or reframed to accommodate our wishes or preferred pace. It simply is. As I stand here before you thinking about time, I am reminded of a poem I read long ago. It is a poem by Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, acclaimed Baptist minister, pioneering civil rights leader, and former president of Morehouse College during Martin Luther King's uh, Jr.'s education there. It is a poem Dr. Mays delivered during his first congressional speech. And the words are as follows. I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer it, suffer if I lose it, give an account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. On this first Sunday of the Lenten season, I stand here in time to remind us that this season is a time for prayer, a time for fasting, a time for self-reflection, a time for repentance, 
and a time for spiritual reorientation. It is a time for prayer because without prayer, we are without the full armor of God to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. Without prayer, we are without hope, without purpose, and without spiritual fuel, the dunamis power of the Holy Ghost to power us from faith to faith, glory to glory. And without prayer, we are without a voice at the altar of forgiveness. God says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. As we traverse time during this season, let us be reminded that prayer is communion with our creator. It is an opportunity to be in divine dialogue with the God in whose image and likeness we are created. American author, philosopher, theologian, educator, and civil rights leader Howard Thurman described prayer as a moment when we surrender our inner consent to God. Therefore, I submit to you that prayer requires truth, transparency, and vulnerability as God reveals God's self to us now in this present time that we may gain that which we need for the time to come. And because our time in prayer is sacred, we must be careful that we do not allow our prayers to be reduced to a form of devotional diuretics where we merely leave our internal toxins at the feet of the cross. No, our prayers must invite the very presence and power of God into every areas of our lives, even the secret places that we may, by the presence and power of God, be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we no longer craved that which produced the internal toxins in the first place. When we pray, God invites us to remain in communion with God until we receive a word from God. For all it takes is one word from the Lord to heal the brokenhearted, one word from the Lord to release the shackles of oppression Systemic racism, disenfranchisement, exclusionary housing covenants, a.k.a. redlining, domestic abuse, and elder abuse. Just one word from the Lord will give us the power to lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely that we may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. At this time, some may ask the question, since prayer is so powerful, why then do we need to fast? One of the reasons we fast is to strengthen our prayers. For many people, therein lies the problematic, the non sequitur, the comment that does not seem to logically flow from that which was said before it. But let us remember the words of Jesus in Mark 9, verse 29. Upon the disciples' inability to cast an evil spirit out of a child brought to them by the child's parent, the disciples took the child to Jesus. After Jesus cast the evil spirit out of the child, the disciples asked Jesus, Why could we not cast it out? Jesus replied, This kind can only come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Another reason we fast is to further demonstrate to God our love for God and our willingness to sacrifice the pleasures of this world that we may join in the ministry of Jesus the Christ who sacrificed his life to allow us access to eternal life. We also fast as a spiritual discipline to train our minds and bodies to overcome temptation. During this season of Lent, in addition to prayer and fasting, we engage in the practice of self-reflection, meditating on our character, our actions, and our motives. Remember, 
as human beings, we are what theologians call the imago Dei, meaning image bearers of God. And as the imago Dei, it is important that we invest time in the mental and spiritual process of juxtaposing the word of God against our true selves. It is a process that helps us to better understand that when we find a way to drown out the noise of false narratives and labels others have placed upon us, as, we, as well as the labels that we have placed on ourselves, when we stop judging others who sin differently than we sin, when we stop weaponizing our intellect and weaponizing our emotions to drop the mic on everybody as we display our membership in cancel culture, we get to a place of honesty, a place of transparency before God's throne of grace, realizing that there are one or two cracks in our character, a bit of animus in our, some of our actions and a touch of manipulation or malice in some of our motives. And in that space of honesty, in that space of self-reflection, the need for our repentance is revealed. So there, in the presence of the God of all creation, the God of love, justice, grace, and mercy, we ask the Lord to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. And there, in the midst of our petition, we learn that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. We learn that even during the times when we had mud on our mirror and did not clearly reflect the image of God, the love of God, the justice of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God to those we encountered along the way, God, in response to our petitions, in response to our transparency, renews and restores us to a greater level of spiritual integrity that we may have strength for the work that lies before us. Prayer, fasting, Self-reflection, repentance, each is an integral component to reorient our hearts, reorient our thinking so that our words and actions will glorify the God we serve. There is a saying attributed to an anonymous author, and its words are as follows. Be careful of the words you say. Keep them short and sweet. You never know from day to day which ones you'll have to eat. During this Lenten season, we might be inclined to ask ourselves, when do we find time to pray, fast, reflect, repent, and reorient our thinking? I submit to you, beloved of God, that the time is now. The time is now because delayed obedience is disobedience. The time is now because we must plant today the seeds to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control tomorrow. The time is now because tomorrow is not promised. One of the ways to help us understand the power and the purpose of now is revealed in today's scripture passage. The passage begins with the words, As he went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. Notice what is said here. It is an introductory sentence beginning with the conjunction, as. Now for those of us who are familiar with Schoolhouse Rock, Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses. We know that the purpose of this conjunction is to tie this pericope to the previous chapter where Jesus was still in Jerusalem. 
So while journeying through Jerusalem, the place where Jesus encountered a group of spiritually blind religious leaders, Jesus saw a man born blind from birth. Now, it is my contention that in order for Jesus to know that the man was born blind, Jesus would have had to see the man using more than just physical sight. Yes, I believe that Jesus saw the man, not as the disciples saw the man, or perhaps not even as we would have seen the man. Rather, Jesus saw this man in the sanctity of the man's humanity and in the fullness of of what the man was created to be. In other words, Jesus did not see with his earthly eyes, and he did not allow his earthly sight to block his divine vision. Jesus saw the man. The man mattered to Jesus. And parenthetically speaking, no matter who you are, no matter what you are going through. Jesus sees you now. You matter to Jesus now. And God has work for you to do now that will alter the trajectory of your life and the lives of your family. For there is no situation greater than the Savior Jesus. There is no problem greater than the promises of God for your life. And there is no bondage from which God cannot free you. So as we read further, we see that the man's past was soon to be interrupted by a but God moment. He was walking in darkness, but God was now about to do a new thing. He had suffered the unjust judgment of others whose Jewish faith tradition compelled them to conclude that the man's condition was a life sentence for his sins or his parents' sins. But God was now about to free the man and free his parents from the shackles of guilt and the shackles of shame. He was judged for being differently abled, but God was now about to give him the ability to open the spiritual eyes of those who had judged him oppressed him, and written him off as one worthy of dehumanization. As the narrative continues to unfold, we see the disciples asking Jesus the question, who sinned, this man or his parents? Now, I submit to you that the question of sin is, and the associated consequences was not, neither a new question nor a new concept. It was a concept and a question that was associated with the faith tradition and typical worldview in Judaic antiquity, just as it is in Christianity today. Furthermore, the concept and related question is asked and answered many times from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation. But now, Jesus was about to show the disciples a different perspective, one that would shift their focus from blame to a deeper belief. Jesus was inviting the disciples to look beyond the fault to see the man's need. And in seeing the need, to address the need with the power and purpose of now. Now that you see the opportunity for God to be glorified through your actions in this moment, use your God-given gifts now that the power of God may move through you to heal, deliver, and set free. Jesus then speaks these words. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Notice that Jesus speaks here in this sentence about the now. He is not speaking about the past nor the things or the people places of the past. Jesus is saying that now is a moment in which we disciples then 
as well as disciples now, must do godly work we are called to do. In addition, in that moment, Jesus' now mission was to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 29, verses 18, and Isaiah 35, verse 5, and Isaiah 42, verse 7, as the promised one who heals blindness. For in all recorded scripture, only Jesus is credited with giving sight to the blind. There in Jesus' statement, in Jesus' now moment, there was a sense of urgency for Jesus knew that he was moving through the corridor of time to his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross. So there was not much time remaining to do the prophetic works that led to that moment. In recognition of the speed in which Jesus was moving toward the cross through time, Jesus believed and he embraced the present centeredness of now. I believe he accessed all that was in that moment, the problem, the purpose, the possibility, and the power to effectuate change. A change in the disciples' perspectives and a change in the concrete reality of the man born blind. This statement, Jesus' statement that as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me, serves as a stark reminder to Jesus' disciple in John 9 and to us, the disciples of today, that there is power and purpose in now. Each of us is purposely gifted and inexorably set by God in time to be on time as a blessing to the body of humanity. When we allow ourselves to see beyond the distractions of our day, we gain the ability to see more clearly the divine works we have been called to complete. I believe Brother Kirk Franklin says it this way. If all you see is all you see, then you're not seeing all there is to see. So as we continue to find ourselves in a relentless pursuit to find purpose in the pain we suffer, let us be reminded during this Lenten season that pain is often a pathway to the passion we need to pursue our individual and collective purpose. Our individual and collective purpose, which is to glorify the God we serve. It is in moments of life's adversity that God issues a clarion call to faithful believers to serve as compelling witnesses to the world. During this Lenten season, I believe that God is calling us to a level of leveling up as believers. God is calling us to hear the cries of the needy and help God is calling us to seek the lost and serve as signposts to the Savior. God is calling us to be dispensers of love, dispensers of grace, and dispensers of mercy. God is calling us to bear witness to the joy of our salvation. God is calling us to identify and examine our God-given gifts and lay them on the altar of consecration. God is calling us to learn the power and purpose of now because in this moment, now there is the power of God. And we have the power of God to forgive and be forgiven, to love and to be loved, to learn to be patient, to be kind, to eradicate envy, to be done with boasting, to purge our pride, to learn how to honor others, to lay aside all conceit, anger, and grudges, 
to shun all manner of evil and ungodly disobedience, that we may learn to rejoice in truth, protect the vulnerable, trust in God, and in God's ability to work through others. Hold on to hope and persevere in adversity. During this Lenten season, may we press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. May we not grow weary in well-doing. May we know that our Redeemer lives and through prayer, fasting, self-reflection, repentance, and spiritual reorientation, may we learn to embrace the power and purpose of now. Thank you for joining us today. We thank you for your prayers and for your financial gifts, and most of all, for your fellowship. If you believe that the Spirit of God is calling you now to a deeper level of love, where you can be liberated from your fears, where you can receive life and life more abundantly on this side of the Jordan and in eternity. We invite you to give your life to Christ. Just call the number on your screen or type the link into your computer, your smartphone, your tablet, or other device. And Sister Adrian, who loves to share the love of Christ, will rejoice with you as you give your life to Christ. As I take my leave, I offer to you this benediction. May God speak to you during this Lenten season in visions and in dreams. May your heart be intrinsically tuned to the syncopated rhythm of God's heart. May your mind be sharpened and your tongue conditioned that truth may be your only words. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of God's hand.